wonderful hymns there tonight, Father. We are so grateful. And again, we thank you just for the, uh, the writers, the musicians that put all this together. We can sing these hymns of praise and place and in your presence. And uh, just what a blessing to our heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so what I want you to do here this evening is we're going to look at several passages of Scripture. And uh, let me put this up on the screen. I have to acknowledge my ignorance and frustration and a whole bunch of things this morning. You see these little PowerPoint gizmos? They all look alike. So I just grab one out of here, and it ain't mine. Mine is in my office. So batteries are good, preacher ain't. But here we are tonight. You should have this on your screen. This is where we left off this morning with the challenges that God gives to us. Knowing these things out of 2 Peter chapter 3. Three times he makes that statement. Three times he escalates the responsibility and the duty that we have because we know that what for sure is going to take place, Revelation chapter 1, the new heaven and the new earth. The things that John virtually said. In chapter 21 and 22 of Revelation, twice, if not three times, the angel says words to this effect, these things are faithful and true. In other words, it's an affirmation, it's a confirmation that everything that John witnessed is going to take place. When Peter writes, he also is writing from the viewpoint that it will happen. It's just that uh, society in the world gets a little bit lazy with the idea that there will be the day of the Lord. And so uh, in the meanwhile, he says, don't let it get to you. Don't allow the uh, influence and the mentality of the world or even uh, the lethargic Christian affect the way you live. So he left us with these words to be godly, to be diligent, to beware, and to be growing. And that was the takeaway uh, from our study this morning on the subject of heaven, destination, and whosoever will may come. We find that also in Revelation 21, 22, twice, he that is thirsty, let him come and drink from the waters freely. So up to the very end, God offers and issues the invitation to be able to enjoy all of the things that John was uh, given and that John wrote. And then we have them in our possession here today. So what I want to do is uh, continue that thought uh, a little bit, but it's always good to have some kind of an idea of a timeline. And this image, I believe, best portrays what the, the timeline is going to look like. When um, Now, this should have a little laser button on it. If something happens, it ain't my fault. There we go. We, this is where we're at right now. We are in what we would describe as the, as the church age. And in that is what the seven churches that Paul, uh, John saw the letters and received, seven churches of Asia Minor. Historically, uh, the different ideas, but primarily they, rec uh, they represent seven historical eras of time, we being in the probably the Laodicean age, the last church. The event, the major event that's going to take place next is that of the rapture of the church, found in 1 uh, Thessalonians 4 and also in 1 Corinthians 15. During that period of time is the marriage supper of the Lamb, and we prepare to mount up on our white horses with Jesus for the second coming of Christ. In the meanwhile, there is a seven-year tribulation that takes place. Then there will be, followed by 1,000-year millennium, and then we end up in, John, in Revelation chapter 21 and 22 with the new heaven and the new earth. So that uh, helps us in what is happening. But another way to look at that it is also this way, that when we get to heaven, while all of this uh, a disaster is happening on earth, there are some things that are going to take place. We just, I put them in a, an order so that we, we get the... Uh, to get to see the heavenly perspective. Obviously, 
I'm going to go through these quickly. The rapture of the church being the first one, what was given to us in 1 Thessalonians 4. Then we would look at the Bema Seat of Christ. And each one of these uh, has the, the tone of be prepared for this. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 uh, spells that out for us. 2 Corinthians also in chapter 5 in those two sections about the readiness for the things that we do, the uh, deeds done in our body are going to go through the test of fire. We will also have toward the, at the end of the tribulation period, the marriage supper of the lamb. And this is the great event where the bride of Christ is feasting with Jesus in the white robes of uh, righteousness, Revelation chapter 19, verses seven to nine. Uh, give us a very clear picture of what is taking place there. Then do we have the return of Christ. When I was explaining this to the fourth graders, I said, here's the exciting part about it, uh, is the fact that the return of Christ to earth, it goes so, something like this. If you're a believer, we just got done having dinner with Jesus, and he says, all right, everybody mount up, and you get to have a horse, because when we read the text of scripture, we ride down with him. And he's going to destroy all of those enemies that at the end of the millennium just rise up and uh, revolt against God. It's a one day battle if it even lasts that long because he has the, his uh, carrying the sword coming out of his mouth and the girdle that he is faithful and the righteous one. Uh, but we, we see that vividly that we come down with that army. So we are finally going to fulfill the song, the words of the VBS song, I'm in the Lord's army, except we're not going to be all geared up. It's going to be just that of the horses and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we have uh, the next event, the sad event that takes place, the great white throne judgment. We reviewed that briefly this morning. And here again, uh, the books were open, the plurality of books, the, the numerous works, none of which passed scrutiny. And then immediately after that, John takes us to chapter 21 with the, the introduction of the new heaven and the new earth. So that, that took us then to that we are now in heaven. And the purpose of this study here this evening is to put things into a perspective because immediately you find out from point number one till we get down to point number six, there are numerous events that take place. The timeline for all of those events are, are 1,007 years. That's a fixed number. And during that period of time, especially uh, during the thousand year, you know, what, what, happened, what happened to uh, all the people that, that we uh, know and have gone home to be with the Lord? What happens to our bodies while we uh, wait for this tribulation period in this thousand year period of time to take place. Well, that's the, pur that's, uh, the purpose of this evening, just to kind of expand on it. And one of the things, the best way to begin with it is the fact that we, we answer the question, like what is heaven? Not what is it going to be like so much, but what is heaven? And from the, uh, the, the words that you see up there when we say heaven, it can be referred to the atmospheric heavens, where in Genesis chapter 7, we're told that when the flood started, that the windows of heaven were opened and the rain came forth. So as we stand here and we see clouds, the breathable air would be described as the atmospheric heaven. Then we could talk about a planetary heaven, which uh, Psalm 19 would uh, point out to us, uh, verses 1 to 6, quoted by Paul in Romans chapter 1 how the heavens declare the handiwork of God and the firmament dis, uh, displays his glory. Heaven is also described as a place where God dwells. When we read Paul in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he talks about being in paradise into the third heaven. And there it's, he saw things that were unspeakable. So we, um, or, and there are other texts of scripture that also describe this. But when, when we say what is heaven, we are really talking about uh, the, the third bullet point, and that is the place where God dwells. That's heaven, and it's eternity, but it's a, a reality of a place. It's a positional place, but at the same time, uh, in that place, it's not limited by time and space. And one of the blessings of it 
that as individual believers die, they go home to be with the Lord. As Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So at that point in time, when we look at 2 Corinthians 5, 8, Paul makes that quote. One thing that's interesting, when Paul writes Philippians, he, he puts an emphasis on uh, the, the body on earth and the new body in heaven. Paul's letter from Philippians was written from prison. And I believe that Paul expected death at any moment. And so at any period of time, so while he's writing, he makes a strong urgency, a strong reference that this body is nothing, that one, to die is gain. To live here is good for you, but the profitable thing to, to die is gain. Why? Because he knew without a shadow of a doubt of being able to receive that new heavenly body. One of the things that we, let's go to Psalm 16, that it happens immediately at death. And uh, this is probably one of the, uh, the best, it, one of the best Psalms that you can memorize. And uh, you'd want to do that because um, it was Dietrich Bonhoeffer that made this statement in his time when he was in prison under Nazi Germany that it, death is not the fear of the Christian, it's the process of dying. That can be the, the believer's fear. And that includes then the physical suffering, maybe some of the anxiety of, of what about loved ones, how will all this take place, et cetera, et cetera. A multitude of things under different circumstances that would go through an individual's life. And, and there's an element of truth to that because it's the idea of death that keeps us alive. So we don't want to dismiss death and take it lightly. Otherwise, we'd be very careless in our activities and would not care what happened to us or other people. But there comes that point in time that uh, we, we, we want to have something that is deeply embedded in our heart. Psalm 16, preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, thou art my Lord, my goodness extends not to thee, but to the saints that are on earth and to the excellent in whom is all my delight. Let me drop down there to verses 10 and 11 real quick. Verse 9, therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not allow my soul in hell, that is in the, the state of deadness, in the place of the dead, which can also be referred to as the grave. For thou wilt allow my, not allow my soul in a temporary location Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption, but rather thou shalt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. The psalmist, and this is quoted, stated other texts of scripture, especially in the psalm, it knew that immediately, as Paul says, to be absent is to be present. It's a continuum. It's from one to the other, the blink of an eye, all of that is what heaven is, is part of what heaven is going to be like. So that th these passages of scripture help us to get some idea of the immediacy and, and the transformation that takes place in a believer's life. What will we be like? That, that's probably one of the, uh, the pressing questions that oftentimes comes about. And again, the scriptures answer these questions. And one of the things for sure, in thy presence is fullness of joy that we read there in uh, verse 11. So that should be Psalm 1611. In thy presence is, the, is that of joy and pleasure forevermore. If you just stop and think about that, I capitalize the, the, the key heading perfection. It's going to be that of a perfect pleasure. It will be a pleasure that uh, that never changes. It, it's never uh, ebbs and flows. It is absolute, undefiled, perfect pleasure. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we are told that there's a knowledge that will always be there also about the different things that will pass away of the spiritual gifts. But we're told in that passage of scripture in 13, 12 of 1 Corinthians, that, not, that love and knowledge will continue. We look at comfort. Go to Luke chapter 16 
And uh, when we look at that passage of scripture, we learn something else about the whole idea of, of that of comfort. Luke chapter 16 and verse 25. And here, and Abraham said, son, remember thou in thy lifetime, you received good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. So he makes a comparison between suffering in hell and that life of being in heaven where there is total, complete comfort. We will also recognize that there will be a perfect love and there's going to be a perfect joy. So when Jesus makes that statement in Matthew chapter 25 and 23 of enter ye into the joy of the Lord, into the presence of the joy of the Lord, it's uh, the best way to describe it is, is an atmosphere. Maybe the cl closest way that we can associate with it is uh, if in sports you go to a, an arena or a stadium and you sense the atmosphere of competitive spirit and cheering and rallying on uh, the team players and all that surrounds you. You may have a few deadbeats who are just sitting there eating hot dogs and really could care. That would be me. You know, these guys are overpaid and all that kind of stuff. But the truth of the matter is you, you can't get away from the idea that there's an excitement, we say it. How do we say it? There's an excitement in the air. Well, that only goes so far, but when we're talking about a joy, and in the very presence of joy, the atmosphere of joy, a heart of joy, the language of joy, songs of joy, we've never seen it. But that's what God has in store for us. So, look at a timeline once again. We're in our deathbed, we close our eyes, and at, by God's grace, we, we pass on. There's no holding pattern. It is opening our eyes to be able to, as the song tonight, to be able to see him face to face. Well, what will we be like? Well, to be sure, we're going to have this new glorified body. Let's go to John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29 for a moment and um, take a look at the, the words of Jesus on that subject and then we'll turn to another well-known passage and that is going to be in 1 Corinthians uh, and that's going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 36 but in John chapter 5 verses 28 and 29 the, the words of what happens to the dead the righteous dead and then also for those that were unrighteous and here we read these words, marvel not this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of, the, of damnation. So there is going to be dead, there are going to be an hour and or there is going to be a voice. Now, Paul finishes that thought when he takes us to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That would be the voice of the archangel. That would be Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, when John hears the voice of the archangel calling, Hup, come up hither. So the dead are going to come forth at that point in time. And obviously the good and the evil are, are not good works and bad works, but rather that of uh, those that are righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is the text of scripture that best describes the bodily transformation. And, uh, and Paul invests endless verses on th this discussion, beginning at verse 36. Well, verse 35, but some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And question, with what body do they come? Now there's a reason for that question, because the last time they would see the body, it would have, a uh, rigor mortis would have set in, it would have been thoroughly wrapped and with a strong dosage of different uh, perfumes to be able to help subdue uh, the decaying process. And so wrapped and bound up, placed in a cave, the stone or something in a sepulcher rolled in there, that is the last a way that the people would recognize a body. So the resurrection is one question, but the second part of the question, with what body? 
And Paul simply says, by rules of nature, there's a death that takes place before a new body comes forth. Thou fool, thou fool. That which thou sowest is not quickened or made alive, new until it die. That which thou sowest, you sow not that body which shall be, but bear grain. It may be chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God has given it a body that pleased him and to every seed his own body. So that's, well, that's all the further that we need to read. In other words, the original seed placed, placed into the ground is when the plant comes forward is not like the original seed. It is a new body. And Paul uses that as a very simple illustration that to every seed, it has its own body. And when you sow that seed, a piece of bare grain, it comes forth as wheat or some other grain. In other words, no longer a seed, but something new. The glorified body that we receive and to be with Jesus in the presence of the Lord is that is exactly that. It is a new, fully equipped body that is made so that we can be and dwell in that heavenly place. Uh, that's, you know, and there are other texts of scripture that, that help explain that and make it clear. But I, I wanna close out with this thought, that when we talk about heaven, it's more than just an excursion of information. In the Bible, when, the Paul, when the Paul writes about it, it's always spoken with the idea of, of anticipation. It actually can have the effect of making us more fervent in our faith, more fervent in our endurance, and we can actually see uh, greater things take place. And just as a quick reference to that, you look at Hebrews chapter 11, and uh, of, of all the saints that were suffering persecution, they pressed on, they persevered. Why is that? Because the earth and everything, the kingdoms that were offered to them, if they would just change their mind, they would not accept it. Why? Because they looked forward and they saw a heavenly city, one that was yet to be had. And that's where their hearts were. That's kind of like the final place that we want to be as we live on this earth and as we live as believers, that we are so driven by the reality and the anticipation of heaven that it has a transforming effect in the way that we live. So in, first, in Colossians chapter three, Paul writes these words for us. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of earth, for you died and your life is hid with Christ in God when Christ, his, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You realize how much is in that passage of scripture? It's another sermon. We're not going to go for it. But I am going to point out, highlight some of the things. The first one is this, that we are raised with Jesus. By virtue of our relationship with him, Romans chapter 6, that when we were buried with him by baptism, we also are risen with him. But because of that, he's telling us that we have, the, the whole idea is now that we are saved. It is a direct reference to then our salvation. And that word if can either be understood as conditional, but the same Greek word also has the idea of, of since. So we would actually more accurately translate it to say, since you were raised with Jesus, to seek those things which are above. It speaks of our salvation. The second thing that would take place is Paul makes an emphasis to seek out those things which are above. And also where Christ is sitting, set your mind on things above. Well, what do we have there? Well, in that, he, the verb usage of seeking is a continuous present tense indicative statement. In other words, keep on looking forward to and for heaven. 
things that are above. How do we know it's heaven? Because that's where Jesus is, where Christ is. Notice he associates above with a person. And above is also a place. So wherever it is located, which, by the way, is, is not just a, uh, a place with boundaries in a perimeter, it is in the heavens, and it's probably, it does not have any limits to its territory or to its time, but it's called heaven. Jesus is there, sitting on the right hand of the Father. And again, we're reminded, it is things above. Set your affection on things above. Why? That's where Jesus is. Where is Jesus? He is now in the heavenlies. So when Paul writes this, as saved people, our duty, it should be our heart to set our affection on those things which are of above. And notice that he says, and not on the things of earth. There's, so the, the, the human heart can have affections. And to be decisive, it's either going to be an affection for this world, which Peter says, why do that? It's going to be dissolved, or it's going to be an affection, a desire, a looking above, a seeking for the things which are above. So he speaks clearly of heaven. This is the best part. Christ, who is our life, appears. Then you also shall appear with him in glory. Now, you wouldn't know that unless you read the book of Revelation. And you got to the last part of chapter 19. And here we find that Christ appears and Revelation 19 tells us that we will appear with him. That refers to his second coming back down to the earth. And it's going to be a glorious event. And we will appear with him in glory. So all of the, the, the idea of the second coming of Jesus coming back down to this earth Paul writes that in, in this passage of scripture. And so he talks about now of our salvation, our continual seeking, the, the uh, place of heaven by way of that, 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 that wonderful thing that God has given to us called an affection, a desire, a, something that drives us and moves us. And then the, the very place, in the fact that we are going to uh, have that day from heaven, we will be with Jesus when we appear with him in glory. So that's it for the, the lesson. That's it for the, the future explanation of what it's going to be like. But let's take into consideration of this. It really is something uh, that you know, we'll probably do it just this one time and at a time of a funeral. And that is when we were reminded that of a, of a place called heaven. But when you look at the scripture writers, when you talk about the people that lived, there was always an anticipation in the New Testament day that it could be tomorrow, that the Lord is going to re return at any moment, at any time. I think even John expected to see that. I mean, after all, after looking at all of those things, there's no indication given to him as to how long he'd have to wait for it to take place. So what would pray, our prayer request would be, and when it comes to our, our own personal lives, our own souls, we this, Lord, just give me that taste, that taste of glory, that vision for heaven, that anticipation for heaven. Do not worry eh, that, you're, that because of, you know, well, I become so heavenly minded, I'm of no earthly good. There are, I believe there are believers that are of no earthly good because they're not heavenly minded enough. There's just not enough desire there to seek the things that are above. Uh, so many, many great works have taken place all throughout history because of people who loved his appearing and just could not wait to get there. And they wanted to bring as many others with them. So we pray and we ask God to open our hearts and renew our hearts, rejuvenate our hearts, to be thinking not of a concept, not of a principle, but of the very place of heaven that is actually the, the residency and the presence of God and the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Thank you, Father, that we have these truths. Now use them to move our hearts toward a living for you and waiting for that day to be able to uh, say with Peter, hastening on to the coming of the day of the Lord. Help us to be diligent, to remain godly, help us to beware, and also, Lord, to be growing in grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.